Signore e signori, buonasera. Benvenuti, welcome, welcome to Tutti a Casa, live chat on All Good Things Italian. And I'm delighted to welcome my guest for tonight's uh, episode of Tutti a Casa, Antonio Monda. Um, for all of you who are friends of Casa Italiana, Antonio Monda is a familiar face and a familiar presence, and for many others. Uh, I'll be very brief in the presentation. He's the director of the Rome Film Festival. He's a professor of film and television at New York University. He's a writer uh, currently writing a series of 10 books about 10 decades in New York City. Um, he's a contributor and the columnist for La Stampa. And um, tonight we're gonna talk about films. Antonio, since all these started, we decided to create this series and the title is Tutti a Casa. We haven't given any time to discuss the title of our series. Why don't you tell us uh, where it comes from? First of all, good afternoon and good evening. Good afternoon because I'm in New York now. Yes, of course, the title comes from a great film of 1960, directed by Luigi Comencini, one of the great masters of Italian cinema. It's a beautiful film, but it's quite overlooked for several, several reasons. I mean, the same year, in 1960, in Italy, you had Fellini directing La Dolce Vita, Luchino Visconti, Rocco and his brothers, Roberto Rossellini, Era Notte a Roma, and Vittorio De Sica, Il Giudizio Universale and many, many other films. So even if you make a good film or a very good film, such as Tutti a Casa, you're sort of overwhelmed and overlooked because of these fantastic other masterpieces. Still, it's one of the best films of the period. It was produced by Dino De Laurentiis. I'm underlying this because De Laurentiis was the greatest Italian producer. And every element in this film is, is, at, is top. For example, the screenplay is by Ages Scarpelli. And the protagonist, as you can see in this picture, is Alberto Sordi. But I have an anecdote because De Laurentiis, who was the real boss, as usual, the, didn't want Sordi. He wanted um, uh, Vittorio Gassman for the lead. And for the father, who was played by Eduardo De Filippo, he had in mind Toto. For a series of complicated stories, they couldn't participate to the film. And at the end, and I think it was good, it's much better as a couple. Uh, Eduardo De Filippo and Alberto Sordi played in the film. But you have many other fantastic actors. For example, Serge Reggiani, we all remember him um, as a chansonnier, but he played many roles in Italian film. One, one of them is Ciccio Tumeo in The Leopard, Il Gatto Pardo. And there is Carla Gravina, Didi Perego, and many other great character actors. It's again, one of those great work of craft, if not work of art, but certainly something that we want to remember because it's still very timely. And it's one of these bittersweet comedies about history that makes you reflect on history and at the same time with a smile, with a bitter smile on your face. The film is actually available online for free legally and you can look it up. I believe the site is Daily Motion and it's in two installments, no. uh, Primo Tempo, Secondo <laughs> Tempo. So Tutti a Casa, that's what gives the title to our series. Of course, it, it has to do with the period in which we're living. Apparently to, today, as of today, half of the world is a casa, is at home, is forced to stay home. Um, we put a capital C in our title because it also means that once this is all finished, we will all go back to our casa, to Casa Italiana Zerini Marimo at New York University. So thank you for uh, bringing us back to the memory of the film that gives the title to, uh, to our series. And the jingle is taken from the uh, beginning titles and was composed by Julian Sachs and the graphic by Francesco Mussini. Can I just say something about the film? I have a lot, another anecdote about the casting. Uh, a few months later, Dino Risi wanted to cast Alberto Sordi for his surpasso. And since he had just finished this film, he casted Vittorio Gassman. Uh, so many great films are made by chance, you know, many great performances. It would be inconceivable today to imagine uh, Tutti a Casa without Alberto Sordi or Il Sopasso without Vittorio Gasman. And I want to add Absolutely. another line about Luigi Comencini. I define him uh, a craftsman, but I don't want to minimize him at all. He's one of the great Italian filmmakers. And together with this film, we made at least another extraordinary film, The Adventures of Pinocchio, for television, for right television. That to me remains the best adaptation of Pinocchio for film or television of all time, so far. 
I uh, love I'm not for the Garone, I must admit, but but definitely that is. Uh, I'm partial to Comencini. Uh, Antonio, since this all started, you are actually offering a great service to the community because you're providing from your Facebook page uh, one film a day suggestion and, and you promise to arrive to a hundred films and as I always say you are somebody who has a knowledge not only of Italian cinema but cinema in general that I, I probably have not seen any in anybody else so today I'm asking you to make a one more effort and from the 100 films that you are proposing uh, from your Facebook page and let's hope that we don't have 100 years of isolation, 100 days of isolation ahead of us. But I'm asking you to come up with four, five of these, your favorite films that you think we should all see or watch again if we have seen him, if we have seen them already. What are they? I, number I, one. Okay, number one is definitely City Lights, Luci della Città by Charlie Chaplin. I think it's the greatest film ever made with the most moving ending, moving finale ever screened, ever filmed. Uh, it's about recognition, it's about pure love, it's about redemption. And uh, Chaplin uh, was defined by Fellini as Adam, meaning everybody who makes movies descend somehow from, from Chaplin, especially Fellini. And in fact, my second film is a Fellini one with another great ending, The Nights of Cabiria, Le Notti di Cabiria, uh, which was made in 1954, uh, 55, sorry. And it stars, of course, Giulietta Massina playing a prostitute. I think you all remember the film. The reason why I picked this film and not other great masterpieces by Fellini, I consider Fellini the greatest director of all times, especially- We're gonna go back to Fellini because we want to celebrate his 100th birthday with you in just a few minutes. But Absolutely. continue with Nights of Cabiria. Okay, okay. Nights of Cabiria ends with another great and moving, touching ending. Giulietta, playing Cabiria, is she's robbed and almost killed by a man who presents that he wants to marry her. She has lost everything. Uh, however, looking at a group of young kids dancing and having fun in the street, she's first moves and then she smiles. But the genius idea of Fellini is that she's she looks into the camera and she somehow tells us that we need, we must smile. Why do I say the word smile? Because one of the great songs of Chaplin and see the relationship is a smile. So they both have the same idea. Although life is full of misery and desperation, we need to smile. And this is something that I think it's very important, especially nowadays. Today, absolutely. Antonio, Fellini was very reluctant to mention uh, film directors that inspired him or films that he saw, he would always play that down. He didn't want to sign, sound like a film buff or an intellectual. We know that on the other hand, he had a vast knowledge of world cinema. And the, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, what, one of the few that he admitted that he would watch religiously were Buster Keaton and Charlie Chaplin. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, to men to define Fellini, I like to use one definition that Jorge Luis Borges used for actually for Orson Welles. He used to say, he's not intelligent, he's a genius. <laughs> and he was not an intellectual at all. I met him only once, uh, to be honest. Uh, and, and he played this, of course. He played to be not intellectual. He knew much more than you could expect, but he didn't, have, he didn't have all the weakness of an intellectual. He didn't show off at all. And he liked to uh, watch popular culture on television, silly shows, great comedians, uh, uh, silly music, for example, circus. I mean, did you notice that uh, all his films with Nino Rota, incidentally his best films until orchestra rehearsal with the exception maybe of a couple, uh, have a, a score that starts from the circus, our rearrangement for circus tone, tone, because this is what he wanted. He felt at home in a circus. And, and he has narrated this several times, most notably in The Clowns. What is your next I, film, Antonio? After... But I want to go back to Fellini. Eh? Promise that we oh, go yeah, back we're, to Fellini. We're, we're yeah. going to go back to Fellini. No worries. Next film? The, the third film is The Godfather. The Godfather is a flat-out masterpiece. Of course, it's a controversial masterpiece because, in a sense, it celebrates mafia, or at least all-time mafia. And it's a fact. 
I mean, uh, it generated imitation, horrible imitation, and there is no doubt that this band of this band of people are criminals. They do horrible things. Don Vito uh, kills people when he's young, <laughs> kills a, a horse. James Khan plays Sonic, kills several people and then go on. And especially Al Pacino, Son, uh, sorry, Michael Corleone kills his own brother, Fredo, and his brother-in-law, Carlo. However, there are two extraordinary ideas in this film. First of all, nobody in the film is morally is superior to the Corleone. All the others are worse. So somehow you root for them. Uh, politicians are not better. Cops are not better. Union leaders are not better, etc. Actors are not better. Singers. There is a character who is clearly Frank Sinatra, who asked not to mention his name, and Mario Puzzo in the original script called him Johnny Fontaine. The second great idea is that uh, Coppola and Puzzo before him sees the man, not the criminal. Uh, he made us recognize something inside their soul that everybody has. The friendship, the honor, uh, the fatherhood, the relationship between a father and a daughter. There is the most extraordinary moment in the film. It's in the wedding at the beginning, where you yeah. see Don Vito Corleone dancing with Connie Costanza. He calls her with her Italian name. You don't see a criminal. You don't see an assassin. You see a father. That's, that's pure magic and pure genius. Two questions. I hear waves of my Italian-American friends saying, that's the film responsible for the stereotyping of our kind. And, you know, the very recent polemics uh, regarding the use of Fredo to refer to Chris Cuomo, to whom, by the way, we wish all the best yeah, in his the recovery best. from yeah. coronavirus. But, you know, it's such a, an important film in American culture that its characters became what we would call antonomasia, I mean, gave name to figures, to characters. So is that really responsible? Is The Godfather really responsible for the stereotyping of Italian-Americans? Should absolutely. we ban it from our programming? Absolutely yes, and absolutely no, we shouldn't ban at all. Yes, because art, especially great art, is always responsible and risky. Uh, did criminals study from John Gotti, a criminal, imitated The Godfather Il Padrino? Yes. Does this make Il Padrino a lesser film? No, not at all. And uh, since you mentioned Puzo, who was uh, a co-writer of the script, if I'm correct, and also the author of the book from yeah, which the Padrino... The writer, of the, of the, the writer of the screenplay, but Coppola participated, but only Puzo signed the script. And uh, Antonio, I, I, this is one of the cases, and I know that this is another of your uh, Cavalli di Battaglia, of your uh, uh, piece de resistance, uh, uh, the relationship between literature and cinema. Actually, the very first event we did with you at Casa Italiana, Absolutely, I remember. 25 years ago, it was two evenings. One was good books, bad movies, and the other one was the other way around. So that's how I met you the first time. So Absolutely. you talk exactly about this. Would you agree that this is, you know, The Godfather, the book, is it more than decent novel that, that, that stands up in okay, its own okay, let me say a couple of but things. But the film is something else. Oh, what do you think? think? It's a I, I compare them, um, The Godfather to Eight and a Half, to City Lights, to the great films ever made. I would never compare um, The Godfather, the book, to I Promessi Sposi or I don't know, whatever, uh, uh, Il Rosso e il Nero and uh, the other great novels. However, there are two things. First of all, a little anecdote. Mario Puzzo wrote the character of Don Vito Corleone with in mind his mother, which is very interesting. <laughs> and let's discuss if you want about Southern Italian mother. Second. You uh, have a thing or two to say about that and about okay, Maria Luisa, exactly your mother. Have, exactly. Have. Yes. The second <laughs> thing is uh, when you take a book, when you adapt a book, you don't need art, not at all. It's very rare that a great novel uh, becomes a great film. There are a few exceptions, and maybe the next one that I'll discuss with you is an exception. Uh, however, what you need is great plot, great plot and great characters. The Godfather, the book, has great plot, extraordinary plot and extraordinary characters. This is what Francis Ford Coppola needed. And, this, uh, and he transformed Fredo in the unforgettable um, performance by John Cazale, one of the greatest actors ever lived. Uh, and of course, Sonia, Al Pacino, all the others. Uh, 
um, thread that was used recently, and it's really despicable to insult Chris Cuomo or whoever you want to insult. Because Fredo, I, I, I believe everybody remembers it. Padrino, the Godfather, Fredo is the weak man, the weak, sometimes often, often drunken in the, in the film. But mm -hmm. maybe the best definition of the film is given by Coppola himself. This is a story of a king who had three children. One has his goodness, uh, Fredo. One has his intelligence, Sonny. Uh, sorry, Michael. One has his strength, Sonny. It's a tragic. Uh, that that story. sums it up perfectly. Film. Shakespearean and, film. Sorry. Antonio, one one more thing about the the Godfather. It's such a great film, uh, larger than life characters, and it really created an American epic. That after the cowboy and Indians wars somehow gone. That was the previous one, and then you have this one with many followers of different levels. Of course, you have some of uh, Martin Scorsese's films that are based on the same topic that are legendary and that are wonderful films and I mean, have definitely second ranking. But would you agree that this film is also a, a founding stone, a, a, a cornerstone? Absolutely. For uh, the Godfather is an epic and the gangster films, in particular this one, which is a, a spin, something different in the world of, of, of uh, of uh, gangster movies because it deals with family more than more than gangsterism itself. Uh, it's epic because it's young. Epic goes with youth. Uh, so Western are epic. He, uh, once again, Borges wrote that uh, uh, American had America had his own epic with the Westerns, which is true. I mean, if you put together all the John Ford films, you have something not very different from the Odyssey of the Iliad, because you know you have the women, you have the heroes, you have the 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 the, the, the ominous enemies who are racially, <laughs> and because Ford was a great director, but also racist, the Indians or in Native America. But let's not go there. Yeah. Because it's another interesting but completely different conversation. If you want, I'm happy to do it. Oh, we, we're going to have many more conversations with you. You know but that. If you ask me, for example. Uh, is the John Ford opera, Magnus opera, Magna opera, sorry, dangerous? Yes. Is it a work of art? Yes. With a capital Y. Yes. 90% uh, of his films portray Native American are horrible killers, which is racism. How, how do you want to call that? <laughs> but still, they're a work of art. Um, Antonio, what is the next film? I need to push next you. Film, in the next film, you know it, is The Leopard, Il Gatto Pardo. Uh, let me uh, anticipate one thing. Uh, you know, I am a huge boxing fan. Yes. Nobody, nobody. Let, let me give a little snippet of how huge a boxing fan you are in your American decalogue of, of books. And you are uh, writing number eight, if I remember correctly. I'm writing the eight, number eight. You're writing number eight. In all the previous seven, in all the previous seven novels about New York in one decade, there is always an epic boxing match. And yes. I'm not a boxing fan, but when I arrive to that point in that book, I always look for it. And you. there is always something I learn, not about box, but about something else. So Thank for you, the box is also a way to talk about other kind of dynamics but you let's go back to box and the leopard because i really i really don't see the connection there between I'll box and why. the leopard and i want to know it i'll tell you why the greatest boxer of all time is muhammad ali because he was a genius of the ring uh, lucino visconti is joe frazier so he was a great champion but not muhammad ali visconti is a great great filmmaker but with this film he reaches the height of Muhammad Ali. He reaches the height of his, of Fellini, of Chaplin, of the very great minds. This is his, by far, in my opinion, his masterpiece. But if you ask you, Stefano, if you ask Marty Scorsese, if you ask many other people, they might say Rock on His Brothers, Senso, all magnificent films. Why do I think that this film is, is his masterpiece? Because it's clear from moment one that he is the prince. He identifies totally with that aging, uh, intellectual aristocrat, uh, melancholic, who knows everything from moment one. Why this film is fantastic? It's not a perfect film. Different from Godfather, different from Knights of Kabiria, different from City Lights. 
Why is not perfect? The action scenes are not good. Let's face it. I, Visconti was not an action director and all the battle scene at the beginning is very clumsy. Second, another weakness. All of a sudden appears a voiceover from nowhere. And it's clearly something that was added because they cut something. However, the beauty of the film is so solemn, so precious, so luxurious, and so intimate at the same time. It's a film about dying. It's a film about a dying class, a dying breed. Uh, and everything is perfect. The, choose, uh, the, the way he chose uh, Claudia Cardinale, who played the same, the same year, in the, the same weeks a role in Eight and a Half, in a completely different role. The idea of Bar Lancaster, which was not Visconti idea, but Goffredo Lombardo, the producer, and yeah, Visconti had in mind Lawrence Olivier. And uh, his second choice was uh, Nikolai Cherkasov, the protagonist of Ivan or Ivan the Terrible. And luckily, Goffredo Lombardo had this genial idea of uh, casting uh, the extraordinary Bar Lancaster. At the beginning, they hated each other, but they ended up uh, loving each other. And uh, probably Suso Shecky D'Amico was the one who put them, you know, in, the situa in a situation to become friends. And of course, I'll and, end the Antonio, sorry for the interruption, but I remember there was an episode, probably in one of the uh, documentaries that you curated for the Criterion Collection that comes with the leopard. That, and there, of course, we have to uh, say that, that, you know, that there is nobody like our friends at Criterion to prepare Absolutely. these That's extra uh, rich, uh, documents, documentaries, interviews that accompany these great classics when they re-release them. Okay. And I remember in one of them, there was this story of uh, Visconti refusing to talk to Lancaster. Do you want to mention about that? Do you want to talk about that? Well, maybe the not the same the was... they, had, they had the same birthday, November 2nd, and they, they were shooting in, in Palermo, and they had the same idea. They went to Renato Guttuso to order a, a painting for, for the other. So Gutuso did two very similar paintings, one for Visconti and one for Balancaster. I think that's the anecdote that you remember. And without- Do I had something else in mind, but this is great. I didn't know this, so I'm learning and it's great. No, what the one I had in mind is that they refused to, you know, uh, Visconti refused to talk to, each other, to, to him directly. And he would ask his assistant director, tell Mr. Lancaster to do this and tell Mr. Lancaster to, to say that. And then he started taking a liking because Lancaster apparently was very humble. And he accepted this awful treatment and he was already a very established film celebrity. And then finally, Visconti started to take him along to dinners in uh, the palaces of Sicilian aristocrats because he wanted to show him what a Sicilian prince is like. And then Lancaster at the end of, of all these dinners uh, reached the conclusion that Visconti wanted me to have a Sicilian prince in mind, but he's the prince. All I had to do was to imitate, imitate. him, yes. nobody else. Even if he was not Sicilian, he was a Milanese prince, but still. And, and as you said, the great friendship came out of it. I know you, you could talk about The Leopard later. for hours. Absolutely. It, it's, it's one of the greatest films. Uh, Twelve years later, when Visconti made uh, Conversation Peas, uh, Visconti had a stroke a few months before, and nobody would insure him. And Lancaster... Paid him, paid him the insurance himself, which shows how great was the friendship between the two. And I think now will be completely unconceivable, uh, the leopard without the, the, the extraordinary performance of, uh, of Alan Caster. And nothing moves me to tears, almost like the end of City Lights of the end of Noites of Cabiria, such as the final scene where he weeps in the bathroom. You have this incredible dance scene, the ball lasts maybe 40 minutes into the film and everything succeeds. You see that Angelica is seducing the prince. Uh, you see that uh, Tancredi is changing from revolutionary to reactionary. A lot of things happen during the dance scene. He understands everything, goes in the bathroom and cries. And that is one of the most moving scenes ever. And where he cries, I'm sure you remember, is a place full of urine pots. Visconti shows at the same time the luxury and the beauty of this incredible palace uh, and at the same time the urine pots. This is what this film is about, actually. <laughs> Thank you, Antonio. You mentioned, of course, great films. This is the creme de la creme of Antonio Monda's uh, favorite film. Yes, 120. Uh, I can go on forever. I, I know, I know. You could go on, on and on and on. And I invite everybody to actually follow you on Facebook to get these suggestions daily. 
but um, give us one more film um, suggestion for these days of seclusion that would be more fun and uplifting. Do you have anything in mind? Let's pick a comedy. I will pick The Party, which in Italy is called Hollywood Party. It's one of the most hilarious films ever made, directed by Blake Edwards, and of course, starring Peter Sellers, one of the greatest comedian ever and a wonderful actor. Uh, why do I like it? First of all, because it makes me I mean, laugh every time I see it, including this scene. Even this picture makes me laugh. Also because uh, it's an intelligent comedy that says a lot, if not everything, about how silly, how empty, how stupid is that word. However, at the same time, Blake Edwards is part of it and loved this word. However, at the same time, this silly, empty, pompous world makes great films. It's a, such an intelligent film and also so funny. And uh, I think that Peter Sellers is one of the great underrated actors. If you consider he was nominated only once for an Oscar, and he didn't win for being there, the extraordinary film by Al Ashby based on a Jerzy Kosinski novel. So if you want a, a funny film, a comedy, my, go, my heart will go to the party. And as, as, as everybody knows, this is a good time to see streaming films and a lot of uh, companies that offer this service are offering special discounts and some of them free months trials. So it's really a good time to stream to your heart's content. And Antonio gave us some great suggestions. And now we're gonna go back briefly to Fellini. Um, and you have already uh, talked about him, but it's his 100th birthday. And my question is, Fellini didn't really belong to any school, to any current. He has some films that could be considered part of neorealism, like the final uh, a little, tale a of French, neorealism. But yes. <laughs> but he created his own thing. Um, and I just wanted to ask you, do you see any successor of Fellini? Do you see anybody who is making film in his style? No, and would it are, make sense? There are a few filmmakers who adore Fellini and somehow makes films in the, you know, a la manière de Fellini, but nobody can be compared. Let me give you a few names. The first one is Woody Allen. Woody Allen made a few films that are in terms of, not of style or technique or vision, but in terms of content, very similar to Fellini's. If you see Celebration, it's not very different from La Dolce Vita. If you see Sweet and Low Down, it's not very different from La Strada. I mean, I talk, I'm talking about the content. And of course, he adores uh, he adored Fellini. There is a funny anecdote in his uh, autobiography that just came out about him uh, calling Fellini and waking him up. <laughs> and because he didn't realize the different, you know, time. Um, but it's <laughs> extremely funny. And Fellini say, oh, I admire your films. And uh, Woody Allen say, maybe he was lying, but it was good enough for me. <laughs> Even a lie from <laughs> Fellini is good. <laughs> so uh, the second name that comes to my mind is, of course, Terry Gilliam a very uneven filmmaker, but when he's good, he can be very good. I'm talking, I'm thinking of uh, Fisher King, La Leggenda del Repescatore in Italia. The third name that comes to my mind is of course, Julie Taymor, who clearly pays homage to Bellini in some of his uh, her films such as Titus. And maybe, maybe I underlined three times later, maybe something from Emir Kusturica, the great Serbian filmmaker. But uh, nobody, first of all, nobody can beat Fellini like the Muhammad Ali of the filmmakers. <laughs> second, second uh, uh, when you are a genius, you're not, you do not belong. It's, it's you're playing a different game. You're in another class. But Antonio, uh, somebody says that your friend, uh, the Academy Award winner for La Grande Bellezza, uh, Paolo Sorrentino, is somehow making true. films that I, paying homage to Fellini are also um, revamping his style or that are reminiscent or that they have very explicit quotes of Bellini. What do you think about that? Yes, I forgot to mention his name. Yes, definitely Paolo Sorrentino, especially uh, with La Grande Bellezza more than the other films. However, it's uh, a little bit superficial to say that La Grande Bellezza pays homage to La Dolce Vita only because they are about Rome. And Rome seemed to the eyes of uh, another towners. Uh, Fellini was, of course, from Rivini, center north of Italy, not far from your place. And Paolo Sorrentino. I'm in Cinecittà, Antonio, by the way, if you didn't notice. No, you're li a liar like Fellini. 
and, and Paolo Zerentini is, of course, from Naples. Uh, because the reference, and I know as a fact, because he told me uh, from, for La Grande Bellezza is, of, is Roma, which is an extraordinary film. And talking about this, Fellini had a theory, which is quite interesting, that all the great filmmakers made their best film in a 10 year span. It's his theory. But if you count, you know, if you see each filmmakers and take 10 years, most of the time it's true. And even in Fellini, with Fellini it's true, because with the exception of Roma and Amarcord, and maybe uh, Casanova, all his great films are made between 52 and 62. And they are all masterpieces. Let me count them. 52, Vitelloni, La Strada, Il Bidone, Le Notti di Cabiria, La Dolce Vita, and Eight and a Half. You cannot beat that. Of course, he made afterwards Amarcord. He made, uh, you know, extraordinary films, but probably his best moment is 52, 62, 10 years. I just have one little suggestion for our viewers, especially for the ones that are listening to us from Italy. Right now on Rai Play, that is, you know, is the sort of site on demand. It's free. You just sign up and you have access to the entire archive. There is a very funny documentary on the cut scenes of Amarcord. And for somebody like myself that knows the film by heart and recited with my cousins and with my brother every time we can, seeing those cut scenes was hysterical. Yeah. It's like giving, being given an incredible gift that you didn't expect. There is one scene talking about racism where uh, they are at a bar and there is uh, Zio Lallo, that is uh, the, uh, the uncle of the protagonist, that would be Fellini, um, that is at a bar and they're making horrible jokes about a foreigner. We, we, we are not going to disclose his nationality because I want people to go look it up. It's the cut scenes of Amar Kord on Rai Play. Look them up. It's going to be your homework. But you and remember? I'm oh, sorry, God. The finish. entire thing is hysterically funny and very well done. And then there are interviews that the two people that were actually on the set with Fellini of for Amar Kord uh, edited. And then they went to ask him for what he thought about these cut scenes. So there is the comedy in the comedy in the comedy. So don't miss that on Rai Play. It's the cut scenes of Amar Kord. Antonio, let's close on Fellini. I just want to leave you one last uh, line because I know how much you, you love him and how much you uh, are indebted also to Fellini's uh, own um, ability. There to are be so many things you can say about his greatness, his poetry, his inventions, his vision, his humanism. But let me try to be simple, not intellectual, as Fellini would like. He's one of the few directors who makes you laugh and cry. Is so funny. He can be, he's one of the funniest filmmakers ever, but he can be so tragic. Think of Il Bidone, for example. And this is purely genius. Only Chaplin has the same, you know, greatness. Uh, can I say only one thing about, you mentioned the uncle in uh, Amacord. He's played by Nando yes. Fay, one of the Orfei family, the famous circus family in Italy. And, um, and he's the only vile and not loved character in the film. He's the fascist, but he's a, even a vile and vulgar fascist. He's an opportunist, he's a, a coward. Uh, you see that but, Tito's father despises him totally. Yes, he hates him, yeah. Antonio, we are getting close to the, at the end of our conversation. Definitely, we're gonna have you back. I wanna thank all the people that are uh, watching us live and uh, somebody was noticing your Pulcinella statue right behind you. And, uh, I'm Neapolitan, I'm proud of have Pulcinella, but I'm also a New Yorker. Look at this, this is a Tiffany lamp. I'm so proud of it. Okay, Antonio is Neapolitan. He was born and raised in Rome. His mother is from Calabria. Calabria, and so now she will be upset. I'm half Neapolitan, half Calabrese, but I mentioned Napoli because you mentioned Pulcinella, absolutely. Knowing, knowing, knowing Donna Maria Luisa, I had to mention Calabria because I would absolutely. be in trouble. So <laughs> I am in trouble, don't worry. There is, there is a little bit of, uh, of everything from the south of Italy in Antonian, and I think that beautiful statue is a sort of homage to his, his uh, southern Italian roots. Antonio, my last question for you is uh, concerns another um, of your uh, favorite topics. As one of the first things you did when you arrived in New York was a series of films of screenings uh, at MoMA, the Museum of Modern Arts, uh, that also is um, enriched by a beautiful catalog called The Hidden God. And it, it was a series of films 
uh, in which I believe the tagline was in which God is the protagonist, even if you don't realize it. Yeah. Or something along God, those lines. God is the lead and you don't know it. <laughs> God is the lead and you don't know it. We are approaching uh, Easter time in two ways. It's going to be Holy Week. Um, why don't you give us a suggestion of one of those films where there is a, a spiritual presence, a divine presence, and it's not necessarily made explicit uh, in the film, and yet it's there. And we are also going to use that as our closing and as our way to wish our listeners a uh, happy Easter from you, because they're going to see me again before. First of all, briefly, uh, I'm sure you know it, that uh, Pope Francis' favorite film of all time is La Strada by Fellini, which is a deeply spiritual film and religious film. I would say it's a deeply Catholic film. But to answer your question, I would pick two films. One that deals directly with faith and religion, and in particular, the gospel is, of course, the, the extraordinary film by uh, Pierpaolo Pasolini, the gospel according to San Matthew. Uh, it shows what he says with his own word, il mio intimo arcaico cattolicesimo. Uh, I think it's a masterpiece. Is uh, This is the Holy Virgin, uh, who later in the film is played by uh, his own mother, Graziella Kierkos. Uh, I think it's by far the best film ever made on the gospel. And um, But if you ask me a film where God is hidden, where religiosity or faith or spirituality is there, but you don't see immediately, maybe the first film that comes to my mind is Close Encounters of the Third Kind by Steven Spielberg. Spielberg is one of the great living directors and one of the greatest of all times, but often was overlooked at least until this 10th or 11th film, until Schindler's List. It was considered a craftsman, um, um, a professional. An artigiano. Yeah. An artigiano, an artist and not an artist, which is completely silly because this is his third film, and sorry, fourth film, and the one before is Joe's. You can see immediately his talent. And even in his first film, The Sugar and the Express, you can see what Pauline Kell, the film critic from the New Yorker, used to call the phenomenal talent of Steven Spielberg. But why this film? because it says something which is also timely and political. It's the first film where aliens are not a threat, are actually a blessing. Aliens came from the sky to save us, to redeem us, not to threaten us, not to put us in danger. Second, what the film says is, if you're able to lose everything for this, you will be saved. It's not very different from the gospel. Are you ready to lose everything? And this is what Christ asks. And this is what the protagonist played beautifully by Richard Dreyfuss does. So it's a longing, the film, it's a prayer. What the, the character does is to pray and have faith and something will happen. And it's interesting because there is also uh, another character played by Francois Tuffaut. Uh, the name of the scientist is Lacombe. Uh, who is a scientist, who is not a man of faith, is a man of science. And at the end, they, they look for the same thing, basically, but one through faith, one through science. At the end, when the, the aliens arrive with a beautiful uh, starship uh, and another genial idea, the concert between human and aliens is the way they communicate, uh, maybe the key moment of the scene, the film is when Truffaut goes to Richard Dreyfuss and say, I'm so envious because he reached first through fate the conclusion. It's a wonderful film. It's, I wouldn't be afraid to call him a masterpiece, call it a masterpiece and it's a deeply, deeply spiritual film. And it's also very entertaining because it's a Spielberg film. And you asked me before about Fellini, you will make me laugh and cry. Um, Spielberg is an artist, but he's also a huge entertainer. Thank you very much, Antonio. Uh, this was great. Uh, I would like to invite everybody who listen in to this um, episode of Tutti a Casa, please let your friends know what we are doing. Uh, we are trying to bring you great culture, great entertainment with people like Antonio Monda. Our next guest is going to be Michael Moore, who has just completed a translation of The Betrothed. So it's the other Michael Moore. Um, <laughs> he from Mrs. Posi, the great masterpiece <laughs> by Alessandro... Alessandro Manzoni, who has become all of a sudden very, very uh, relevant today because there are 
four chapters in the book oh, yes, that course. talk about the plague of Milan of 1630. So basically, we are reliving today what Manzoni described in his masterpiece uh, of 1840. So that's going to happen this coming Wednesday, same time, same, pla same place. Tutti a casa for now, while we wait to be tutti a casa at Casa Italiana. I just want to remind you also, follow Antonio's suggestion for films on his Facebook page. Uh, also he's also Instagram. about to launch. Also I beg your pardon? The Instagram and Facebook. Instagram and Facebook. He's also about to launch an initiative with Le Conversazioni, that is the series of literary conversations that he has founded with David Azzolini. They will propose little pills from all the writers that were their guests in the different venues in which they hold the Conversazioni. And of course, Central Park West on Rai News 24, Saturday and Sunday, and Visti da Vicino on La Stampa. Thank you again very much, Antonio. This was great. I had a lot of fun, and I'm sure our me friends too. did. Thank you. Call me back. I will be there. We will. I'll see you all on Wednesday with Michael Moore for the Betrothed, I Promessi Sposi. Grazie mille. Buonanotte. Grazie a te.